What is going on, y'all? Welcome back to another episode of Wednesday Football Talk Show here with Ben Hall and my guy Trey Watson. Um, in today's episode, we have a special guest. Uh, but before we start the interview, uh, Trey, how you doing today? Doing good, man. Uh, excited to be here. Like you said, got a special guest, someone different. Um, good timing, just, you know, going into the NFL playoffs. A lot to talk about, I'm, I'm sure. You know, our guy T. Gray Scares here will have a lot to say. Um, you know, play with him in the XFL in Dallas. Uh, we had a lot of fun down there. Season got cut short, but um, I'm pretty sure his story, this, you know, what, 2020, 2021, about as wild of a football story as you can get in one single year. And uh, a lot of good things have paid off. So how you doing, T-Gray? Say that again. And it, I couldn't, couldn't hear. How you doing, man? How are you doing? Oh, okay. <laughs> I'm good. I'm good. You know, hanging in there, just glad to be back on the schedule. Uh, it's been crazy. Like you said, it's been a hectic 2020 and it finished out perfect, you know, and kind of ideal and um, things like that. So I just been running with it, you know, running with it, but definitely blessed. Yeah. So if you could just briefly describe like where you were football wise at the beginning of 2020 and just go through the roadmap of, you know, how all the things you've done basically football-wise and where you're at right now, just to fill people in. Beginning of 2020, okay. Um, 2020, I was with you. We was in the XFL in Dallas. Um, we was in Dallas. We, uh, we played all the way till March, and then a virus stopped our season. And from there, I stayed in Dallas, actually. I was in Dallas. I was working out um, with one of my college teammates. He played for the Cowboys. Um, I stayed down there for a few months, working out with him. And then um, from there, I, I drove back to the Midwest. Cincinnati is where I'm from. Drove back to Cincinnati. I was there for a couple of weeks. Oh, sorry, I got a train coming. But yeah, I drove back for a couple of weeks. Um, and then I went to Indiana for at least two months. I was in Indiana, that's where I went to college. So I always find my way back there. I was there for a couple months training. That put me where back to like August. August, maybe? Maybe I went too far, but I was in Indiana for a couple months. I shot back to um from, in, or from Indiana, I'll start working my way back down south. Uh, I went to Florida. Um, I was in Florida for less than a week. I was going down there to surprise one of my boys for his birthday party. And it's funny, you know, this was September because I went down to Florida. I actually caught the virus. It was crazy. I caught the virus in September when I was heading down to uh, Florida. And then September 28th, I got diagnosed. I was, I had the virus and then I was in Florida for three days. Um, a whole two weeks went by, quarantined everything. As soon as I was done quarantining, I got a call from Tampa. I got a call from Tampa. Luckily, I was still in Florida, so that was the easy drive. I was in Orlando. I drove to Tampa for a workout. Um, I was on a practice squad. I made the team. I was on a practice squad for about two weeks, two, three weeks, one of the two. Um, got cut. And then uh, Pittsburgh called me. Pittsburgh called me back. I was here with them in camp last year, uh, all the way throughout the preseason. And then um, they called me back. I was on practice squad for a couple weeks here. And then um, due to just the pandemic things and injuries and stuff like that, I was able to uh, make it to the active roster, you know, playing special teams and things like that. And I'm still here. So, you know, it's like I said, it, it started in the XFL early this year, uh, traveling around, working out, working out. And, and now I'm back here in Pittsburgh and we in the playoffs this week. So it's just definitely been a crazy ride. No doubt. <clears throat> Between Pittsburgh and Tampa, um, obviously two of the hottest, most talked about teams all season long. Um, you know, tell us a little bit about your experiences with, you know, Coach Arians or Coach Tomlin. Um, you know, what you've enjoyed from them, what you what you maybe picked up from either of them along the way this year. 
Um, honestly, I, my time in Tampa was short lived, so I really didn't create a, a true connection with Coach Arias. Um, but I will say his professionalism is outstanding. You know, uh, one thing I noticed about the NFL is they take care of your players. You know, they take care of you. And I got picked up later in the season, you know, so in the back end of the season is, is pretty much not walk through pace, but it's, it's a little up tempo from walk through, but, you know, so for the most part, he took care of us. Um, I mean, he allowed me to come work there for a couple of weeks. So I'm thankful for that. Like I said, I really don't have a lot um, to go off of because I, like I said, it was short lived, but coming to Pittsburgh, it was, uh, it was good to come back. Like I said, I was here in camp last year. So I was here for a few months and it would, you know, like when you come home to familiar faces and things like that, that's how I was here. Like I said, I was here and coach Tomlin is, is definitely a, a great coach as well and um, take care of the players, things like that. And I know, I know I was excited coming back here. Like I said, it's always good when you bounce from team to team and you can come back to familiar playbooks and familiar people, coaching staffs, you know, terminologies and all that thing, all that stuff going play a huge factor when you bounce some teams. So coming back was huge for me, but at the uh, end of the day, both programs are top of the notch, you know, great players, you know, on both ends and, both of them are in the playoffs, so it'll speak for itself. No doubt. Um, you know, you mentioned this this was your first time, you know, getting getting on the active roster. Um, you know, people know, you know, how crazy it is to play your first snaps at, at any moment, but you know, your first official snaps in the NFL, that's the biggest moment you can get. Um, you know, growing up being a prof or wanting to be a professional football player. Um, describe what those first plays were like, um, you know, the feeling leading up to the game to, you know, when, when you were going in on special teams or whatever it was. Uh, just describe that a little bit so people can understand, you know, how, how big of a moment that was. Yeah. So for people who don't really know the story in a, uh, a short, brief overview, I was – I came out of college 18 and i just been bouncing team from team from L.A. to – the Colts to Pittsburgh to the XFL to Tampa to back to uh, Pittsburgh and um, I never played at besides the preseason I never was on an active roster to play an official snap you know so when I came back to Pittsburgh and I was on practice squad practice squad and like I said I had an opportunity to fill in a, a few spots uh, when I got my name called that week I was just excited you know just like wow uh, hard work, consistency, things like that, you know, that I, I try to proud myself on, you know, I was finally able to, you know, reap the, the fruits of the, the benefits of it, you know, and, and I'm glad I never gave up. And, you know, I was excited. I didn't know if I was like, I know I wasn't nervous. It was definitely like an excitement that I was feeling. And, you know, once I got in that locker room and uh, just put my pants on, I was good, you know, in football, but you know, I only had a few snaps to look forward to. I was only on kickoff, so uh, I was just looking forward to doing everything I could on those five. It, I think I had four total snaps that game, four kickoffs that game, so it wasn't too, too much. But, you know, I tried to get everything I had. You know, I've been waiting a long time to just be out there and competing at the highest level, so it was exciting. And absolutely. I mean, that's a feeling I'm still looking to have. That's a feeling people dream of having, you know, all the time. So yeah. it's rare to, rare to get that perspective. And it's rare to have, you know, any kind of experience you had, especially in, in the year we had this year. Um, my last thing before, before it goes to Ben, um, you know, y'all are in the playoffs now. Y'all had an interesting last quarter of the season. Um, finish, finished it off with a wild game against Cleveland. Um, but how are you feeling about the team going into the playoffs? Um, and just, you know, describe, describe the atmosphere around the building, just <clears throat> heading into uh, week one of the playoffs. Yeah, um, it's crazy because for, like, Minka, um, who else? Who else? Having a brain fart, but, like, it's like a, a lot of our – a good players on the team. This is their first playoff round, you know, and um, everybody's excited. You know, we got the regular season out the way and everybody's like, you know, this is a postseason, you know, it's a whole dude, like everything's turned up a notch and 
you know, I'm excited, you know, um, whatever role I play um, to help us win. I think uh, we're fairly healthy, you know, uh, fairly healthy. Our, towards the end of our season, you know, we was already in the playoffs. We just, It was just more for other teams trying to figure out if they make the playoffs and stuff. So we was able to uh, rest a few players, uh, make sure they, they are healthy, everybody's healthy to um, head into the playoffs. So I'm excited, you know, it, I think the playoffs is about who's going to catch heat, you know, who's going to be on fire throughout this, because it's like everybody's right here, right? Everybody's close for the most part. So it's just about who catch fire and who's healthy and, you know, who can sustain four, four more games. So I, I like the team that I'm on, you know, and I'm excited, so for sure. So go ahead, Ben. So now for my first question, um, growing up in Baltimore, I know, like I, I've watched the AFC North my whole life. Um, so what was it like for you, you know, in your first NFL, true NFL season to win the AFC North and kind of get to celebrate that with your teammates? Uh, it's funny you said that because I'm from Cincy. So all ever since I got picked up by the Steelers, I got people at home like, uh, we support you, but not the Steelers and things like that. But, you know, when you get older, it's a business, you know, and they go support and things like that. But honestly, it was crazy, you know, because this conference is getting so much tougher, you know, with Cleveland becoming, um, uh, you know, good and things like that. And then you got Baltimore and then the Steelers and, you know, the Beagles are not too far. So, uh, especially after the season the Steelers had last year, you know, for them to bounce back and, you know, continue to mark their territory in this lead is awesome, man. That environment of winning that game, you know, we, we either had to win that game or we had to have somebody lose for us to win the conference. And both of them, we won and then a team that we need to lose lost. But it was just good for us to go handle business ourselves instead of depending on other people, you know, and got our, our, our hats and T-shirts. That was our big thing, you know, let's get these hats and T-shirts this week, you know, to win our conference. And, and we did it and, you know, uh, we got Avery Williams, you know, our linebacker that came from the Jets, you know, and that program really – haven't had a lot of success. So it was good to see him win a conference for the first time. And, you know, it was just good to see like good players, great players, you know, win a conference for the first time. Cause it's just a beautiful feeling, you know? So it was cool. So now my second question, you know, with all the talent that you guys have on that defense, um, you know, with guys like Watt, Hayward, as you said, Williams, uh, Fitzpatrick, Hayden, you, you know, you, you're not like one of the youngest guys. So I'm sure with everything you've been, you've been able to teach some guys some things, but how much have you learned playing alongside some of those really, really talented players that you've played with? Oh, it's constant. You know, I'm, I'm a sponge and, you know, coming from college where I was a guy, right? At Indiana to, you know, I want to say being humble because I always been humble, but going through that process again, you know, trying to, find my spot, you know, find the right team and, and things like that. And, you know, put what I can give to a team up front and, you know, just deliver. I just been like watching some of those greats, like Wise at practice and, and Hayward. We have Vince Williams, who is a um, eight year, I think, a veteran on our team that I learn from every day. And, and things that I'm learning, you know, is I like to work out. I like to work out often, but at this level, um, even LaMarcus Joyner told me when I was with the Rams, you know, it's, it's 80% mental, 20% physical or something like that, like some along those lines. And, and, and I'm fairly smart, but I know that's probably one of the things that I can work on constantly, you know, just film, walkthroughs, uh, you know, taking advantage of those things, you know. So I was watching Vince when we played at uh, our conference game. Um, he was in, a, in our locker room watching film all the way up to kickoff, you know, and, and in college, our coach was big on, you know, coaching till kickoff and, and things like that. So the process just never stops. And that's one of the things that, uh, that I, I will say that I'm, I'm learning, you know, just the mental, the, uh, the education of the game, you know, things like that. So for sure. So now, right now, you know, as you stated before, you know, you've, you've been playing a ton of special team snaps. What has it kind of been like for you approaching getting on the field for special teams and trying to make plays uh, on kickoffs and, and punts? I'm a competitor. I've been on quite a few kickoffs and, you know, things like that now, and I still haven't had my first tackle. So that's what I'm, I'm thriving for, you know, like 
I, I just always been a playmaker. You know, I like making plays throughout my career. And, you know, I, I realized the people across from me are getting paid as well. So it's not going to be as, you know, easy as, you know, just high school, college. These are elites, like the best in the world, right? So um, every day I'm developing skills, you know, um, that will help me be more successful. You know, I'm watching some players and things like that. But it's just been a ride for sure, you know, just – like I said, constantly trying to learn. So. so now, you know, going into your practices, the the Pittsburgh offense early in the year definitely had really played well. And later it seems like they're starting to come on, come along again. What has it been like for you going against that offense during practice with all the talent they have in Juju and Deontay Johnson, all those type of guys? Yeah. Um, so earlier in the year, I was, I was, um, like I said, not early in the year, a few a month or so ago when I was on practice squad, I was on scout team going against them every day. And I always found myself not to be starstruck. You know, I'm not I'm not starstruck anymore. It's just more so like when I'm across from Big Ben, you know, somebody that's been in the league 17 years, and I'm just watching how he, like, control the offense. You know, hey, you do, like, young guys like Deontay and, you know, Chase, those guys that's coming along still. And um, how he just dictates everything, you know, how he controls stuff. And I just be amused by that. But honestly, it's just one of them processes where you like, um, this is what it is. You know, I'm here. Let me try to uh, help out by any means necessary. But it's awesome, you know, like I like Big Ben and, and uh, Pouncey, you know, just vests like that. I just watch how they practice and, you know, and things like that. Their leadership is ridiculous. So. So now moving away from the NFL for my last few questions, watching, you know, when you were at Indiana, you were one of their top players and in your senior year, you were definitely a top player as you were, I think, the first guy to make first team all Big Ten from there in, in a while before that. Mm -hmm. what, what was it like for you this year? As you stated, you were, you were there for a little while. What was it like for you looking back on that team and seeing how good that team was this year and having so much success in the Big Ten? I was excited, you know, um, Especially when I wasn't employed, I was I was tapped in every game. Even when I was, I was tapped in. You know, I got the Hulu account. I try to catch every game I can. Um, I was excited. It's one of them things. Like that's the reason I went to IU. You know, um, I wanted to go somewhere where, you know, I'm playing against the best teams, and um, I had an opportunity to play early and things like that. And you know, me bringing that type of, you know, attention to Indiana and it's still going, you know, it just feel good to have, I won't say I started it because people before me motivated me to come there and things like that. So it's just been a snowball effect, you know, and now they're finally starting to break through and, and compete against these big 10 teams and actually coming out victorious over some of the, you know, powerhouses of our league conference. So it's beautiful, you know, especially as an alumni, you always want your team to do good and, and they're doing that. They're definitely on the right track. So. It's exciting. So now I'm not exactly sure um, how correct I am, but I, I'm pretty sure you played under Tom Allen for one year and he was your defensive coordinator for a few years. Is that right? Correct. He was, yeah, he was so, he was my head coach for one game. He was my D coordinator the whole year. And then our coach left in our bowl game and coach Allen ended up being the head coach for that game. So, yep, that's right. So, like, this year, it, it seemed like, you know, he really got a lot of media attention and everybody kind of – I'm not learned about him, but saw a lot more of him this year because Indiana was so good this year. So, what was it kind of like from your perspective playing, you know, because you said he was your defensive coordinator and one right. game coach. What was it like playing for him as your defensive coordinator? What kind of guy is he? Oh, the guy that you see on TV, that's him. You know, there's nothing fake about him at all. Um, he's one of those guys I will let my son play for in the future. Um, that's a compliment to him. You know, um, he's, he's a God driven guy. Um, and his energy is contagious and that's somebody, you know, that you want to play for, you know, and, and he's going to give you his everything from um, preparation to, uh, I remember our first conversation when he became our D coordinator, wasn't even about football, it was family, uh, are you religious? You know, all those type things is getting to know you as a player. And, and that will go a long way with uh, players, what coaches don't understand. You know, everybody 
hey, football folk know, like get to know the players and like, and that's who he is, you know, and that's why I respect him. That's why I respect him. But uh, people just see him and his energy on TV and things like that, which, like I said, shall be shown. But him as a as a coach, as a as a, um, somebody that you want to play for, you know, as a as leader of an organization, he's definitely all of those. So now my, my final question uh, before we go, what was it like for you playing alongside Trey in the XFL uh, this past spring? It was cool. He's one of those guys that I always wish I could be, you know, with football. He, he's, he's very football smart besides his athletic abilities. He's very football smart. And I just know, like, I, I, I tend to get close to people who could not, not that I'm using, but like that can push me, you know? So uh, I just noticed like, he's a, he's a great athlete. You know, he got uh, all American honors. He went to the same bowl game as me in, in college, you know? So we are not identical, but we've been through some of the same steps in life. And um, I just like how fast he can catch on to a defense. He was helping me with the playbook when we was in the XFL and, and things like that. So when you can get a guy that, that's not selfish, you know, football smart, um, let alone athletic enough to, you know, just play at the highest level and um, just be a good friend. You know, we, we real cool now, as you know, he's my young brother. So uh, I take care of him here and there and, and things like that. So, but no, nah, he's definitely, it was cool. Um, memories that we have forever um, from practices to, you know, games and, and things like that. So it was a blessing for sure. Yeah. So that that's my final question. Um, I want to thank you very much for taking the time to answer some questions from us. It really means a lot. For sure. Appreciate y'all having me. Yeah, no doubt, man. Appreciate you coming on. Yeah, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, so now for our, our first game that we have, the Colts versus the Bills. Um, you know, last week we saw the Colts on the outside looking in, um, but they got in with the, the Bills-Dolphins game because the Dolphins lost and the Colts were able to pull out their win. And the Colts also had a chance – to get in as their division winner, but um, the Titans were able to pull that game out late. So for last week, the Bills were able to take down the Dolphins. Um, We saw Tua struggle a bit. Um, You know, he had 361 yards, a touchdown and three interceptions, but it was like every time they had a chance to score, it seemed like Tua had turned the ball over. Um, But for the Bills, the Bills just looked great. Uh, And I'm expecting they're going to take that in to this divit, the wild card weekend um, against the Colts. But the big thing for this game to me is what the Bills offense will do against that Colts defense. We've seen that Colts defense really slow down um, some good offenses already this year. Uh, so I'm not exactly sure how, how the offense will look against them, but like, like we've seen the Bills offense is just unstoppable. So how that will happen, I'm not exactly sure. And another big thing for this week, I think the Bills are going to be without Cole Beasley. So Stefan Diggs, we already know, is going to do whatever he wants, no matter who he's going against, as he's shown all year. Um, but without Beasley, whoever their second option, I think it'll be John Brown. Will they step up? Or Gabriel Davis? They're, they're going to need that second option to really step it up. And then third, my biggest point from this game is what Jonathan Taylor will do. Um You know, he had an amazing game against the Jaguars last week. He had 30 carries for 253 yards and two touchdowns. So that was a must-win game for them. Um, You know, every game this year has been a must-win game, but I think we really saw them utilize him so much because they needed that win the most. So I'm guessing this weekend they're going to use him a ton as well and kind of, I'm not going to say limit Phillip Rivers, but we, I'm not throwing a shot at Phillip Rivers or anything, but we know Phillip Rivers has some tendencies to choke at times. So I think they're going to uh, kind of try to utilize Jonathan Taylor more. And I think that's the only way that they could win this game. So for our predictions, I was thinking um, we'll, we'll, we'll do a prediction of every game. So I'm going to go with the Bills for this with this game. And this was one of my easier picks, I would say, just because, you know, there, there's going to be some good games all weekend. So I think this one, it's not the easiest, but it's one of the easier picks. And I'm going to go with the Bills. Yeah, man, I think, you know, the Bills have really just – built up over the, the last second half of the season. And, I mean, they're probably the hottest team in football right now. I think Kansas City still doesn't look beatable just because of how potent they are. But the Bills are just on fire. Um, they, you know, I mean, Miami's defense had played extremely well all year long and what is what was going to give them an opportunity to get in the playoffs. 
And I mean, the Bills did whatever they wanted, um, you know, took advantage of, of, of Tua's mistakes on offense and really just manhandled Miami in a game that Miami had every reason to be playing hard in, um, you know, so they did what they needed to do and, and they looked great. I think even without Cole Beasley, Josh Allen's on fire, um, you know, Stefan Diggs goes without saying, and they've been getting a lot out of those running backs. Um, they've been using a rotation and, and kind of sprinkling them in the passing game as well. Um, they've been getting production from all areas. You know, I saw against Miami, they're, they're like 300 and something pound blocking tight end was catching touchdown passes and running up the sideline. Um, so they're finding ways to make plays and they're going to need to make some against the Colts defense. Um, you know, they've got as dynamic and opportunistic players on defense as you can get um, at really at all three levels. Um, you know, Darius Leonard can, can wreck the game for him at any time. I think he really did that against the Jags and helped them separate there. Um, the, the Colts running game, they finally found, you know, that they're going to lean on Jonathan Taylor, which is good for them. I think, you know, if they're going to have success and beat the Bills, it'll start there. Um, but I just don't see it happen. I think I think the Bills are too good right now. Um, and I think they'll, you know, they'll end up taking that win. So now for our next game, uh, the second game on Saturday, the Rams versus Seahawks. This, both of these teams at one point in the year were playing like the hottest teams in football and have kind of slowed down. Um, the Rams are up in the air with who's going to be playing quarterback. Um, I'm not exactly sure if golf will be back. And if it's not him, it'll be John Walford who in his first throw in the NFL threw a pick on Sunday, but kind of cleaned it up and played pretty relatively well um, for the rest of the game. But the big thing from that Rams Cardinals game was the Rams defense and the way they've played uh, all year. We we've known. And in previous years, the Rams defense is one of the best in football, if not the best. Um, and they really shut Kyler Murray down. Murray went last week at one point, he wasn't going to play. And then later in the week they announced he was going to play. And, you know, he started the game, got hurt, sat out for a while, and then came back in. But he just didn't have it. And the Cardinals offense, who really fallen apart all, like, towards the end of the year, um, really struggled. So that Rams defense is the biggest thing in this Rams-Seahawks game. Um, I'm going to go with the Seahawks. Uh, that was my Super Bowl team uh, prior to the season. And definitely, if we were doing it right now, I don't think I would be taking them. Um, but – I'm really excited to see what this Rams defense and Seahawks offense, the what it's going to be like them going against each other. We've already seen it twice this year. Um, and seeing it a third time will be really exciting. I think the big thing in this game will be whether or not DK can play like he was earlier in the year. Um, you know, Ramsey's going to be guarding him and we know what Ramsey does against top wide receivers and what he's done all year. Um, so if DK can get going, I think that Seattle team will have no problem, but, I think he'll be shut down um, and it'll be Tyler Lockett and guys like that. And Chris Carson coming out of the backfield, which will still be really tough against that Rams D line. So I'm going to go with the Seahawks, but I think it's going to be a nail biter and it could go either way to be completely honest. Yeah. I think it's going to be a great game. Um, you know, for the, for Seattle, it's, it's been almost like two separate seasons for them. Um, early on their offense was probably the hottest in the league. DK was looking like the best receiver in the league. Um, for probably the first five, six games of the season. Um, and their defense was getting shredded, but they were just finding a way to get it done because they were scoring so much and just moving the ball better than anyone else. Um, that's really tapered off. Their offense has, you know, sustained what they needed to do to win, you know, enough games to be in the playoffs, but um, just hasn't looked as great as it did early on. Russ just hasn't been that same level of uh, wow factor that, that there was early in the year. But their defense has stepped up, which has made up for it a lot. Um, you know, they they found a pass rush with blitzing Jamal Adams, picking up Carlos Dunlap. It really changed their defense, and they're playing with a lot more confidence, and they're not looking like the worst pass defense in the league anymore, um, which makes them a more balanced team and, uh, you know, makes this game more intriguing. The Rams quarterback situation for sure will be one to watch. I know um, Goff had the finger procedure or whatever, but they did that with the intent so that he would play – if they made the playoffs. So I'm sure that's what's going to end up happening. How well he plays remains to be seen because he's been up and down all year long. Um, but I agree that that Rams defense versus Seattle's offense is going to be, you know, the key factor. Um, the last two times they played, I don't know the total stats, but I know that Jalen Ramsey was able to, to limit DK Metcalf to a much lower level of production than, than any really any other corner was all year long. Um, 
So if he's able to do that again, that bodes well for, you know, the Rams. Um, they, they've made a lot of plays in their secondary. Obviously, they have the best player in the NFL and Aaron Donald up front who can always, you know, wreck a game. Um, so that's, that's going to be something to watch, uh, you know, if that DK matchup, you know, stays the way it was the last two games. They're probably going to have to lean on Tyler Lockett, lean on the run game, like you said, and um, Russ is going to have to make plays by himself. So it'll be interesting. But um, honestly, it could go either way as far as my pick. Um, I've gone back and forth about it. Honestly, the more I talk to myself, the more it, it makes it harder to pick. Um, but I'm going to go with a surprise, and I'm going to go with the Rams just because I feel like that defense, um, literally Aaron Donald in the secondary, can disrupt things and, you know, it just you never you never know what you're gonna get from that offense for Seattle um, at this point in the season, and and if anyone's gonna be the defense to stop them, it's definitely gonna be LA. So now for our next game, uh, the the Bucks versus the Washington Football Team on Saturday night. Um, this is like I said earlier, the Colts Bills was a easier game to pick. That was probably my third easiest. This is my second easiest game. I'm gonna go with the Bucks. You know, all year. When I've said it's the easiest game, it at, turns out it's not, and I usually get it wrong. But I, I just think that, that the Bucks are going to be too much for this Washington football team right now. Um, if, if the Washington football team even had a, a mediocre or a, a tiny bit above mediocre offense, I think they would be the team to beat in the NFC right now. But that offense has just played pretty poorly, um, and they've had to rely on the defense way too much. So I think this Bucks team will will just overall be way too much for the Washington football team. Um, it'll be really exciting to watch Tom Brady play against the Washington football team defense as a whole. Um, you know, it, it was pretty cool seeing uh, Chase Young for the Washington football team celebrate um, and say he was excited, say he was excited to play against uh, Tom Brady. Um, he's played like a, a monster all year, which was kind of expected, you know, taking him at, at the number two spot in the draft you you expect to get that but the way he's played he's played like a veteran all year which is just insane but um kind of going off of the Washington football team and the way they got in the playoffs uh we saw them take down the Eagles Sunday night and th there was a lot of uh a, a lot of people talking about the way they won the game and uh the Eagles benching Jalen Hurts which in my opinion was was just wrong I, I would never um, think that they, they should just tank straight up like that and bench Jalen Hurts, who, you know, was struggling a little bit throwing the ball. He was definitely struggling, but he was making plays. And that team, I believe, would have won if they didn't bench him. But on the other side of it, the Giants were complaining about that, and they had six wins. So if you can't win more than six games and you're going to kind of complain about a team doing whatever they want to do, you shouldn't have put yourself in that situation. Uh, in the first place so either way like I said I think I don't think the Eagles should have did what they did and a lot of players were against it which I agree with that that was just wrong but I think all football fans should be complaining about it and the Giants should just be kind of quiet because six wins shouldn't get you in the playoff anyways and if you're gonna have to rely on a team you should not be attacking them for that so there's that um but yeah like I said about the Bucks watching the football team I'm going to go with the Bucs. Uh, Mike Evans is questionable. Devin White's out. So, you know, they could be without some big pieces, but I still think the Bucs will just overall be too much for this Washington football team. You know, I'll address that, that NFC East division finish first. Um, watching what happened, uh, you know, in the Washington-Philly game was disappointing for a lot of reasons. Um, you know, you can talk about Jalen Hurts throwing the ball, whatever you want. He was giving them an opportunity to win the same way he had the last couple of weeks, the same way he did when they beat the Saints in his first you know, NFL start. Um, so there, there's no discrediting that. You know, I mean, Coach Peterson said that he wanted to give Sudfeld a shot. You know, there's a time and a place for that. And that time and place would never be in that game. Um, you know, I, I, I heard on a talk show this morning, you know, like people understand when you say, all right, so-and-so is going to be a scratch in the middle of the week because he's got a lingering injury and we have no shot of the playoffs and there's nothing to gain from him playing but risking injury. That's one thing. But if that was the case, you wouldn't have started Jalen Hurts to play that game. You wouldn't have started Fletcher Cox and all the other guys, Zach Hurts, that played that game. And, you know, they said, they said that Jason Kelsey came up to Coach Pearson on the sideline. They said defensive players were literally 
yelling and, and arguing with with the, with their own coach. And that's just a really bad look, um, especially for a coach who just a couple of years ago, you know, took led that team to a Super Bowl. And a lot of those players are still there. And that that's just it just doesn't bode well at all. Um, and it's just really just a bad situation to talk about as far as um, New York goes. I think all there is to say is what Logan Ryan said. Guy I worked out with over the summer before he signed with New York. Um, so I saw how he worked. I saw the type of guy he was. But I mean, he, he straight up told his teammates, "What what can we be mad at? We, we should have won more than six games." Um, you know, you can be disappointed, but I mean, you're sitting here cheering for another team to win when all you had to do was make sure that you know you won the games when you were on the field. I mean, they literally win one more game. And they go seven and nine, and they're the team that's in, which in the NFL, seven and nine is not that hard. It's below average, you know what I mean? Um, so that's that's something that is on them at the end of the day. You know, I saw their coach made a statement, and all of their statements are probably right. That that shouldn't have happened. It's, it's really bad for the league. It, it looks bad on everyone. But they still needed to win the games themselves at the end of the day. But as far as the playoff game goes, man, I'm, I'm excited for it just because – I think, you know, Washington's strength is defense, and it'll be fun to watch them against Tampa's offense. Tampa's offense has looked great the last couple weeks of the season. Everyone look, finally looks in sync. It really sucks that Mike Evans got hurt, but his injury wasn't as bad as it looked because it looked like it could have been, you know, really season-ending for him. But everyone's really clicking for them. Ronald Jones is back, and he's feeling good. Um, Tom Brady is, is throwing the ball all over the place to literally everyone, all of his tight ends. Gronk, Gronk looked great now. Antonio Brown looks really good. Um, you know, he, he looks back to form. And even their own line has been playing a lot better. It looks like they have all their guys back. So, you know, the interesting matchup will be that defensive line versus um, the Bucks front. And if, if they can disrupt Tom Brady, it'll it'll certainly be a game. Um, but that's really the only chance they have because, you know, I just don't see Washington being able to move the ball against Tampa's defense. I think they'll be too disruptive even without – I think they're without Devin White for the game but I just don't see it being enough for them to beat Tampa. So I'm going to go with Tampa at the end of the day. So now for our first game on Sunday, um, the Ravens Titans, I know everybody who's watched this is definitely annoyed as much as I talk about the Ravens, just because I've, I'm growing up in Baltimore, as I said. Um, but th this game is so exciting for me, as I stated before being a Ravens fan, but like just the rivalry that this has created from the Ravens losing in the playoffs last year and the Titans just completely destroying them in Baltimore um, then, and then coming to Baltimore again this year and taking them out again. So th this game has just created such a rivalry just based off of, you know, they've played so much in the past in history um, in the playoffs. And then last year's game had the way that that's turned. So like, as I said, th this game is really exciting for me. Um, but the main point that is big is Lamar against the Titans. Um, what he can do. We saw earlier this year, um, like it, it really was not the, the offense. The offense looked good against Tennessee's defense, um, who's definitely taken a step back from last year. Uh, but it was more the Ravens defense versus Derrick Henry, which we saw twice now. Um, you know, they just couldn't stop Derrick Henry and he's ran all over them. So I think Lamar is going to have his own way against that Titans defense. Um, like it makes me so excited just watching him prove everybody wrong. But the, the, I, I think he, like I said before, he's going to have his own way um, and he's going to do whatever he wants against the Titans defense. Now on the other side for the Ravens defense versus Derrick Henry, the only way there's really no way to stop Derrick Henry. Um, you know, I mean, there is, but Derrick Henry is going to do what he wants just because he, he's the guy, you know, he's one of the best running backs in the NFL. But the Ravens defense can limit him, and I think that's got to be what you're going to have to look for. Um, aside from Derrick Henry, their offense is really just A.J. Brown. Um, you know, they got some weapons, don't get me wrong, Corey Davis, Jonu Smith, but A.J. Brown running some slant routes and kind of play-action passes is what they're going to do against you. And whether or not the Ravens defense can stop it or not will be the difference in the game. Um, but I think the big thing will be Ravens defense being a little bit more healthy than the previous time they played. So I'm going to go with the Ravens in this game. There was no possible way I was going against the Ravens in this. Uh, I just can't. There's no possible chance I can. 
Um, so I'm going to go with the Ravens. Like I said, I think the Ravens will be more healthy this time. Kelly Campbell will actually be playing. Um, and a big reason they announced that they signed him in the offseason was to try and help stop the run, which the Ravens struggled with last year. So, like I said, I'm going to go with the Ravens. And, yeah, I just think the Ravens offense is just going to be way too much for that Tennessee defense. Man, I think, you know, this is the perfect um, game. You couldn't ask for anything better, definitely as a Raven. And really, as, as a Tennessee fan or, or player as well, um, Tennessee is going to come in confident, and I think they should because, you know, lately they've dominated. Derrick Henry has done what he's wanted or wanted to do, and, you know, they pulled out wins. Um, so I understand that perspective. And also, Baltimore has looked really good their last couple games. Um, Lamar looks like he's feeling himself, which, you know, he should be. He, he's doing everything for them. And they've got all the pieces they feel like they need. They, they found what they want to do in the running game. Um, they're averaging like six plus yards per carry between um, Lamar, Dobbins, and, and Gus Edwards. And their receiving core looks like they at least have some confidence right now and can get some things done. Um, so I, I think they'll take advantage. I think it's going to be a great game. I think, and it's not really a great standard, but I think if they're able to hold Derrick Henry under 150 yards rushing, I think there's a good chance they win. If they hold him under 100 yards, they win for sure. Um, but just because, just just how Lamar looks right now, I'm going to go with the Ravens. I think they'll finally get over that hump. Um, it'll be big for him, you know, Lamar's first playoff win. And uh, really just getting over the Tennessee Titans, huh? Because they've just been a thorn in their side uh, this regular season and then obviously the game last year. So now for our next game, um, the Sunday afternoon game, uh, like I said before, the easiest games I've had to pick have always been wrong. So this is my easiest pick for me. Um, the Bears were Saints. We've stated how we felt about the Bears all year. And because the way the Cardinals fell apart at the end of the year, the Bears, some possible way, snuck into the playoffs. Um, so I'm going to go with the Saints. They're not a possible thing inside of me would tell me to take the Bears in this game. Um, but like I said before, the easiest games we've been wrong with. But I just think the Saints will end up being too much for this Bears team as a whole, um, mainly on defense. The Bears offense – which offense will show up will will really be what the difference is in this game. Um, you know, earlier in the year, we saw the Bears play a really tight game with the Saints, um, which was good for them. But the Bears offense right now has actually looked better than it did back then, which is kind of crazy. Um, Trubisky's playing well. David Montgomery has played astounding. You know, he's really been good for them. Um, but I just think the Saints offense – the Saints offense versus the Bears defense will be the matchup to watch in this game. Uh, that'll be the main matchup. But w will Kamara be playing? I'm not I, – I don't know what is going on there. Um, he tested positive for COVID a couple days ago. And that – I don't – I know it's a – I think it's a 10-day 10, um, 10 day thing they have to sit out. So I'm guessing he won't be playing, but I'm not exactly sure. So what Drew Brees can do without him – um, will be up in the air. Uh, Drew Brees has had his up and downs all year. So he's, you know, he, we know what he can do in the playoffs. Um, and the Saints have really got the short end of the stick in the playoffs the past two years. Uh, and their fans will definitely let you know about it. But I think this is a great start for them. Um, Michael Thomas will be back, I believe. So I, I just think they're going to be way too much for the Bears as a whole. But like I said, we never know. So I'm going to go with the Saints in this game. Yeah, man, I think, you know, I don't obviously don't know the extent of the Kamara situation. Um, don't know whether he'll end up being in the lineup or not. If he is, that's huge. Um, just because he's – him and Derrick Henry have been 1A and 1B um, most of this season. You know, he scored 21 touchdowns, six of which was in his last game. Um, and he's, he's been unstoppable, man, running the ball. And then obviously we know how good he is in the passing game. Um, and, and how much he helps, you know, Drew Brees, and then getting Michael Thomas back at the same time. If they both play, um, I think, you know, that, that opens up the opportunity for a really easy win um, just because they, they have all the pieces they need. And Emmanuel Sanders played great uh, the other night, you know, when they didn't have a, a ton of other options. He was able to, you know, make some plays, uh, look like his younger self a little bit. And the Saints defense is, is extremely solid and, you know, makes a lot of plays when they need to make plays. And I think this would be a game where they can do that. 
Um, you know, they, they should be able to hone in on Allen Robinson being really the Bears' only down-the-field threat. Um, and then they should be able to limit the run game because the Saints' run defense is, you know, just the last couple of years, they've, they've been one of the best. So now for our final wild card game of the week, uh, Steelers versus Browns on Sunday night. Um, you know, we just talked with someone from the Steelers. Um, but I think the, the, the Browns just won't have enough in this game. Um, you know, we've seen the Steelers. We've seen two different Steelers teams all year. Uh, you know, early they started off 11-0. and 0, And then, you know, the second half of the year, we've really seen them struggle. But um, the second half of the Colts game, if the Steelers offense can play like that and the defense can play like that as well, the Steelers are one of the top teams in the NFL. But if we see what they did against the Bills or the Washington football team, they're one of the lesser teams in this playoff. So it's good to see the Steelers starting to turn it on late um, after towards the end, at the beginning of the end, um, we saw them struggle. It, it definitely hurt them there. Um, you know, then we saw guys on the sideline fighting this Sunday. Um, and we've definitely seen just not too much out of them. So I'm going to go with the Steelers overall. I just think th th this team is just too much for the Browns. And on top of everything, the Browns have had, they're having COVID issues now, which is the worst possible time that you want that. Um, they're going to be without their starting left guard, which is going to kill them. Um, but Will Baker be able to step up? I just don't believe so. I Baker, I'm not, and I've stayed on this, I'm not a fan of Baker. Um, you know, he's tough. He just, I don't think he has as much talent as some people give him props for. So the Steelers defense, I think, will just be way too much for them. <clears throat> and I think they'll be generating a ton of pressure. And overall, I think they're just going to beat the Browns. You know, before the whole COVID thing happened um, with the Browns, before the head coach was stated that he'd be out, I – was up, kind of up in the air with this game. I still was going to lean towards the Steelers, but I thought it would be a closer game. But now with everything COVID going on with the Browns, I'm just going to have to go overall with the Steelers because I think the Browns are going to be too banged up and the Steelers just overall a better team than the Browns. Yeah, man, I think, you know, everything going on is kind of the perfect storm for the Steelers to show that they're looking like, you know, how they looked early on in the season uh, when they were really just firing on all cylinders and looked unstoppable at, at one point in time. Um, it, it's definitely tough for the Browns fans, you know, first time in the playoffs in so long, and then you're hit with all these issues, which, you know, makes it even harder. Um, but they, they took a big step this season overall. I didn't expect them to play the way they did, especially not after, you know, Odell goes down and that's their number one weapon. But they found a way to lean on the run game and, and you know, they found new weapons and Donovan Peoples-Jones got more out of Travis Landry than they did the previous year. Um, and, and got it done with their defense. Uh, so, you know, they were able to beat the Steelers last week, but obviously that's with Mason Rudolph and the Steelers not really putting everything into that game. I think, you know, the Steelers have a, a lot of big-time players. You know, T.J. Watt, arguably one of the defensive player of the year candidates, or for sure one of the candidates, could be that guy. Um, you know, they've got players in the back end who can make a lot of plays. Um, you know, Big Ben's played more playoff games than probably everyone on the Browns combined from all their previous stops. Obviously, the Browns don't have any. Um, so, you know, I think all of those factors just will make it too much. Um, along with the COVID issues, the, the Steelers just will be able to get it done. So now, before we wrap this up, um, moving into college football, um, we, we saw the college football playoff this past weekend. And um, so first, I'll get into our first game. Um, uh, Alabama just dominated Notre Dame, which we stated. Uh, we didn't even do – we did – we just did the point spread because we – everybody in the world, I think, knew Alabama would win this. So, we technically lost because uh, Bama only won by 17. But it's kind of frustrating because if you watch that game, like, it seemed like Alabama won by a million. Like, at no point did uh, Notre Dame pose any threat on winning that game. Um, you know, Alabama came out early and played like Alabama always does. And late, they didn't really generate a ton of points, but they had their game in control and didn't really need to. Um, so it was kind of frustrating to see us lose on that. But um, Alabama dominated that game and did what we thought they would do. And Notre Dame struggled, which we thought as well. Um, but it's just it's so impressive to see what Devontae Smith has done for this Alabama team. Um, 
you know, we had 130 yards and three touchdowns. And right now is actually going on the Heisman. Um, the Heisman presentation is actually going on. And I don't think there's any doubt he will win uh, just because of the year he's had. Um, with Waddle going out, Alabama really needed their wide receivers to step up. And coming into this year, after the way Waddle had been playing, a lot of people um, didn't have Devontae Smith as high on their draft boards. But now with what he's done in the past few weeks, Devontae Smith is going to be a top 15 pick, I believe. Um, and he's playing like it, if not a top 10. Uh, so, like I said, he's probably going to win the Heisman. And Alabama heading in to the national championship has a lot, a lot of momentum. And um, it was definitely good to see them just – play against Notre Dame like we thought they would. Yeah, and I think that game was exactly what we said was going to happen, exactly what everyone knew was going to happen. Um, the spread thing got killed, and that, I mean, that hurt hurts better more than it hurts us, but it got killed late. Notre Dame scores a, a garbage touchdown and then has a nerve to call a timeout to throw a Hail Mary <laughs> when there's no chance of winning the game. Like, I mean, if, if that's not a, a Notre Dame thing to do, like, what, 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 what purpose does that serve, man? Um, you know, Bama let their foot off the gas, which, I mean, they have every right to. I mean, it, it, they showed it was that easy. Um, I mean, Devontae Smith, Mac Jones, and Najee Harris did whatever they wanted to do. Got all kind of highlight plays against them like like they did against everyone else. It, it was no different. And like you said, there was never once a chance or a time in that game where you even remotely thought Notre Dame could win, which is sad because it's the college football playoff and you expect better than that. But at the same time, you didn't expect that with Notre Dame and we, we got what we, we knew was coming. Um, Next year, hopefully we can maybe see Maryland in that four spot and we know Maryland will at least put up a, a good game. Um, But moving on to the other semifinal Ohio state versus Clemson. Um, This was a little bit unexpected for me. You took Ohio state. I took Clemson. Um, But I'm not sure if either of us really thought Ohio state would dominate this game the way they did. Um, Justin Fields played like, played like one of the best quarterbacks in college football um you know he played like the best uh quarterback in college football on uh Saturday um you know he had his he had his guys back and I think that kind of held him back against Northwestern um a lot of guys after the Northwestern game kind of it started to fall asleep on him and I know I will admit I was one of those people um not really now looking back on it it was kind of stupid to count Ohio State out of this Clemson game just because given the fact what they had to deal with um, with COVID and everything against Northwestern, but Ohio state ultimately played like Alabama caliber um, an Alabama caliber team coming into this playoff. I thought Alabama would overall win it, but I thought Clemson would be a close second. And now I'm kind of flipping it. Uh, I think Ohio state and Alabama, if Ohio state can play the way they did will be a great game. Um, their defense just played so well and stopping Clemson, you know, Lawrence still threw for a ton of yards, but it wasn't like, like, if you watch this game, it didn't seem like it, uh, Trevor Lawrence, I still think will go number one, but he, he just didn't play the same way that I kind of had expected him to. Um, but Ohio state's defense, like I said before, just got to him. Um, they got to ETN and shut down the run game. Um, and then on the other side of the ball for their offense, Trey Sermon had his own way. And like I said before, Justin Fields played so well. And Chris Olave torched, I mean, completely torched Clemson's DBs all game. So heading into this uh, championship game before, I don't think I would have felt this way if it would have been uh, any different of a game. But the way that this Ohio State Clemson game went, I think this Alabama Ohio State game could be a great game. Um, and yeah, like I said, so now. Coming into that, after you um, talk about the game, we're going to do a pick. So I'll just do my pick now. I'm going to go with Alabama still. But like I stated before, I still think it could be a great game. Um, but it will be a ton of great matchups in this game. But like I said before, I'm going to go with Alabama. Yeah, man, I think, you know, this game ended up being everything that I thought it could be and all, all the factors really lined up. Um, all, all season, Justin Fields' one thing was, you know, unforced errors, completely unforced things that he hadn't done the year before um, with them and things that there was no reason for him to do. He did it against Indiana, um, you know, when he felt a little bit of pressure and he did it against Northwestern again. 
and there was just no real re rhyme or reason for it. He had one bad throw against Clemson that, you know, he didn't need to. He forced it for whatever reason, but it didn't matter because, I mean, he had, what, six touchdowns, made every possible play he could make. Um, you know, there probably were people who were comparing the the Skalski hit to what happened last year when when Sean, Sean Wade from Ohio State hit Trevor Lawrence. Not at all the same, um, you know, Sean Wade's hit shouldn't have been targeting, but I mean, there's there's nothing you can say about what Skalski did. Um, you know, he he was risking injury to himself more so than anything, um, and, and and that's you know, I don't I don't like ejecting guys due to targeting, um, but that that certainly should have been a foul. And I mean, he needed to be removed if he thought that was okay because he risked his life on that play. I talked to my friends, and a lot of them said it reminded them of Ryan of the hit that injured Ryan Shazier, which it really did. Um, his head was completely down, his neck was exposed, and that's all he hit with. And that's something you just can never do, ever. Like, there's just no rhyme or reason for that. Um, it's unfortunate, but, you know, it's also fortunate at the same time that he's he's healthy. But Ohio State, you know, they took advantage, man. Um, Clemson's secondary was, you know, in, in my opinion, um, just at, at risk because they were young and hadn't really played great all year long. Um, they had been exposed at times, and they they certainly got exposed in that game. Um, they got absolutely taken advantage of, and Clemson really didn't have any answer. They couldn't stop Sermon in the run game, and they had no answer for the pass game. It was disappointing to see, you know, that's how Trevor Lawrence and and uh, ETN went out. Um, not their best performances. You, you expected them to step up more and, and do more for their team. I was impressed by number 17, the receiver. Um, he thoroughly dominated his matchup one-on-one -on -one versus Sean Wade. Um, honestly, it was a disappointing game for Wade. Uh, he was he was getting torched left and right. And that's that probably makes that the matchup to watch in the Bama game because Devontae Smith has made every DB look terrible. And, you know, if Sean Wade doesn't play at his highest level, it could get ugly. And I even, I even read somewhere that Jalen Waddle is coming back for this game. I don't know if that's true or not, but if it is, that makes it even worse. Um, so that's the biggest thing to watch in the championship game, man, is, you know, it was Clemson secondary against Ohio State. Now it's Ohio State secondary against uh, Alabama, just just because it takes it to another level. Um, those are, you know, with Waddle back, those are two of the top five receivers in college football um, and going against a secondary that, you know, one guy's had his struggles this year after being a, a projected high pick and they have some youth at the other spots. Um, so that'll be something to watch. And, you know, those guys are going to get their numbers regardless, like just like they have all year. And it'll be if, you know, Justin Fields and the offense can match that. But at the end of the day, I want to take Ohio State because I, I took them in the first game and they, they proved me to be right. Um, but this is one of those years, just like it happens every so often, where Alabama is just at a, at a slightly different tier than everyone else in college football. And, and this year feels like that more than really any in the past that I can think of just because of how well-rounded their entire team is and how, how deep they are literally everywhere. So now um, just one last thing before we go um, on, on Sunday or Saturday, I can't, I can't remember. Um, we saw Maryland land a five-star linebacker. Um, so I just thought before we go, we need to give coach Loxley um, what he deserves. Um, you know, we, we've, really called out the people going against Loxley all year. And this, um, I really, really wanted to bring this up because um, we really didn't get to talk about um, Maryland because they weren't in the college football playoffs, but landing uh, the number one inside linebacker in the country coming off of a two win. Now I know they didn't play as many games, so they would have had more than two wins in a regular season, but coming off of a two win um, year is just, especially given the fact that the inside linebackers from Miami um, and Maryland really in a normal year with a different coach wouldn't have had any possible chance at landing uh, this guy. It's just incredible to me. And I think this really just shows where Maryland's program is at. Um, you know, I really think they're rising and I've stated it before. I think Maryland fans need to allow Loxley to have um you know, his recruits really start to get in there and play. So next year, um, I'm really, really excited. Um, I said before, I think it would be cool seeing Maryland as the four seed in the college football playoffs. I think that's a bit of a stretch, but seeing Maryland ranked um, 
again, I think we could see, and I really think we could see this Maryland team just be a really good football team next year with Talia. Um, you know, they got a Marcus Fleming, a wide receiver from Nebraska, who was really well, who was playing really good there in his freshman year. Um, but yeah, like I said, it was just incredible to me to see Loxley just completely completely recruit a, a great defense the way he did and, um, you know, build this defense the way he did in this 2021 recruiting la- recruiting class and to top it off, uh, add the five-star linebacker he did. So I'm just really excited for that, and I just kind of wanted to bring that up. Man, look, that's, that's program-changing type of stuff, man. Um, you know, landing a five-star is huge. Doing it two classes in a, in a row is even bigger. And then landing the number one linebacker in the nation from a, a place that is not, you know, a recruiting hotbed for, for Maryland football is big. Um, and it's going to establish a, a new connection because now, you know, Miami players, Tallahassee players, Tampa, Orlando, those players are going to now tune in and say, okay, well, why this guy who was the best, who whooped on all of us, you know, why did he choose to go to Maryland? And Coach Lossie was able to get that done in a year where he couldn't even get into a room with him for, you know, home visits, couldn't bring him on campus for official visits. He was able to get all that done without any of that. Um, and that just shows, you know, what a little bit of what he brings to the table, how valuable he is um, and, and what the, you know, what the outlook of the program is moving forward, man. I mean, we got the number one linebacker in Maryland. We got the number one linebacker in the whole nation. Um, you know, so, so linebacker should, should be one of our hot spots next year with, Chance, you know, having two years of experience, of really good experience now under his belt. He looked great this year um, when he was healthy. Fanage looked like he could provide a lot of different things. Um, I know Ace is transferring out, but, you know, you bring in two, two top level guys, you know, now your center, your, the center of your defense is looking extremely talented and has a balance of experience, youth, and, and a lot of athleticism. Um, that helps your football team out. It helps, you know, give everyone else on the defense confidence. And then on the opposite side, we bring back Talia, who's going to be in his second year in an offense, who hopefully will get a, you know, a full offseason to work, um, get spring ball with his teammates, um, bring back all of his receiving weapons and, and, and all of the running backs besides Jake. Um, all those things bode to, to adding wins to, to next year and, and look like, you know, we're going to be able to keep building on what we're doing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um... But that is it for this episode. Um, you know, it was a really exciting episode. We had a great interview and um, talked a little bit about the playoffs. But um, uh, thank you very much for watching. Um, we look forward to hopefully hopefully having you guys back next week as well. Um, and, yeah, thank you very much for watching. And be on the lookout for uh, some more special guests as we go on. Yes, sir. Thank you, guys.